So to now try to bring it all together, we've started talking about free particles. We talked a bit about momentum eigenstates. There were now some Fourier transforms. Let's pull some threads together. So first, we have our momentum eigenstates. These satisfy the idea of saying that my momentum operator applied to this function will give me the momentum of that function times that function back. But now notice that we're writing this as a function of position. That this is saying, well, what does that look like in position space? And you could imagine this as basically saying, okay, I have position, what does this look like? Some sort of wave, cool. But now there's a different way we could write this. And we could instead think about, well, what what is this? What is my wave function expressed in position space? What that means is now my horizontal axis is not going to be position, it's going to be momentum. And so what would that look like? Well, so let's call this now, right? If it's our eigenfunction, let me um, pick a value Oh, there's no good way to do this. So let me call this P, but like the double P, like that, the paragraph sign. I don't know if you can quite see that on the value in the video. So the idea is that this has a specific value of momentum. So if I applied my momentum operator to it, then that would equal a very specific value of momentum, and you would get your state back. Now notice that I, I've now written it this way, that I'm not saying necessarily what my form is here, but I could still have a momentum eigenstate that has a very specific value of momentum. And I'm calling that fancy P. So what that means is that at that value of momentum, I have my, my thing. This is basically a delta function. And everywhere else it's zero. The only value of momentum it has is that. So this is actually gets to be the idea of a Fourier transform. So there is basically one specific wavelength, wave number, frequency, whatever you want to call it here, and, and one value here. And so it can be really helpful to actually think about our wave functions in momentum space. What that means is actually what is the distribution of momenta. Now we've been building up to this slightly. You've done, since like the first or second chapter, some histograms of what your measurement values would be, like what are the different spin values. And then that moved into energies. What is the histogram of different possible values of energy? And so eventually, it's going to be interesting to, for instance, say, okay, I have my distribution of momentum. Notice that it can go to negative infinity and positive infinity, yay. And so maybe what I have is something that looks like, you know, this, I'll say plus P, naught, and then I have some value here that's minus P naught. And I say, oh, my wave function is this. Well, notice that if these are equal, that's then the superposition of a wave going to the right with a certain momentum and to the left with certain momentum. And if it's an equal mix, this is actually going to be your standing wave. So this would be, for instance, one of the eigenstate energy eigenstates in an infinite well. You could have this in free space as well. This would be a, basically a standing wave in free space. Um, so just, just keep in mind that oftentimes we could have dropped, oh, it's a function of x and still known what's going on. Now we're going to start working both with uh, p functions of position and with functions of momentum and going back and forth. So it's critical that you actually start noting what it's a function of. So where we're going to go with this is that we can build up now our wave function. And so if I have any wave function I want as a function of position, we know that we could basically build that up as a sum of our eigenstates. And now we have our momentum eigenstates. Nice. But we actually can basically do a Fourier transform and I'm looking in my notes to make sure I get the normalization right, because the normalizations start getting weird. And so 
we have, and most of the normalizations come from how delta functions work. This is how we can move from momentum space. So phi p, so what your momentum function is, and uh, let me actually try to match the book's notation. In this case, it's just, it's, it's not that phi, it's this phi. And there's two different phi's, it's very confusing. You still have e to the i px over h bar, and now dp. So what this is doing is saying, OK, if I have a function of momentum, right? So like this could have been that momentum, like the momentum wave function that we can convert that back to a spatial representation by basically thinking about this. If, if you kind of think about it, it's almost like these are your coefficients in the Fourier transform we've been doing. And based on how I drew this, that's exactly what it is. So this is basically your Fourier transform. Um, but now the uh, momentum, sp momentum space is confusing, but in that case, I mean vector space. But the momentum representation is then taking the place of your coefficients. Now we can go in the opposite direction, which sometimes you want to do. And again, notice here that I'm using psi for a general wave function of position. I'm using phi for <clears throat> a general wave function of momentum, but there's a slightly different phi that we were using for our eigenstates. I'm sorry. So we have the same normalization coefficient. So if you ever get this memorized, you only have to memorize one. And then we again have the integral condition. So what's going to go here? Our psi of x. But now we're kind of going in the backwards direction. This would be the inverse Fourier transform. So it can't look exactly identical. We get a minus sign here. Yay, we're done. And then what is this integral over? Well, x. So the idea being that we want here momentum to vanish. So we're integrating over all momentum. So what we're left with is a function of position. Here, we want our position to vanish. So we're integrating over position, but we're left with then a function of momentum. So this is something that takes practice. Again, the simulations are great because in many simulations, you can see what's happening spatially, and it will also show you the momentum distribution. And so this just takes a lot of practice, going back and forth. And there's really only certain things that we talk about this with, um, in particular wave packets or the big ones. But then this is allows us to have some sense of what's happening over time, since the time evolution relates to energy and energy relates back to momentum. So please practice with this. Again, the simulations are a great way to have some conceptual sense of what's happening before you jump in and just do a bunch of hard math. So this is basically a Fourier transform. The Fourier transform is the much more general term for this um, that again occurs in acoustics, it, occur it occurs in other fields, but then this is in particular the quantum mechanical version of it. So notice that the book is really going through the quantum mechanics in Appendix D. I think it, it talks about the Fourier transform. So I know that not everyone has seen the Fourier transform before, so please make sure you understand the basics of that before you jump into really the quantum mechanical version of it.